There are a couple of graphic images which I say, Ruth thought perhaps we should warn you, and I'm going to say it as an invitation. You know, please look at those images because it's the bad dreams they give you that will inspire you to, uh, to act on them. So to get to the point, um, as you've already heard, uh, Canada and Australia share auspicious superlatives. Where I live, we have the largest commercial slaughter of marine mammals, and where we are now, you have the largest commercial slaughter of land-based wildlife. And as I began to read about what was happening to kangaroos in Australia, I couldn't help but feel that I had heard this story before. Not just what was happening to kangaroos, the violence to individuals, to families, to communities, the threat to populations, but why? And as I went on, I found there was more. Not only are the alleged reasons for the slaughter remarkably familiar, but they're based on the same outdated assumptions, the same unscientific premises that we regularly encounter in Canada. And the legal context is similar as well. Both countries have animal protection legislation, but the protection that it implies does not in any way coincide with the facts and images of what is really happening on the ground. So, in sum, I have come all the way from the other side of the earth to tell you a story about Canada that is really your story in the end. Uh, and what I hope and what Voiceless hopes in doing this is that as we begin to recognize the commonalities, we can deconstruct them. And we can apply our creativity and work together to try to find legal and other kinds of strategies to try and more peacefully coexist. So with that lofty goal in mind, uh, I'm going to tell you an old and terrible story that plays out every spring on Canada's eastern shores and is winding up now as we speak. I'm going to start with uh, a bit of an overview of the history of the hunt and then focus on the legal framework and turn to a number of related issues that um, are not identical, but I think you'll find are very similar to the kinds of issues that arise in the context of your kangaroos. So the story begins, as all terrible stories do, with a lesson in property law. So many people in this room uh, will recall the name John Locke from their student days. Some of you are in your student days and may be studying him right now. You remember him uh, in this building because he was the primary architect of the Western theory of property rights. You'll remember this, in particular the notion that a property right gives its owner exclusive use and control of an object. You may also remember that the reason Locke embarked upon this uh, contemplation and his ideas about property arose out of his desire to find a way to uh, ground a private entitlement to animals and to other natural resources, hence the term. So Locke subscribed to the biblical view about creation and human supremacy, and Genesis says that the earth and all of its resources were created for the common use of all people. So in that case, how could any one person appropriate any natural thing without infringing on the rights of everybody else? How could I take a tree that belonged to the entire community? So here's what he did. He was very creative. He determined that, well, we belong to God, but our bodies belong to us, as does the labor that our bodies perform. So if we attach our labor to an object in nature, we can appropriate that object. She who fells the tree earns its exclusive use. The person who, <clears throat> excuse me, when a person takes control over or kills a wild animal, it's his to keep. So right then, at the very dawn of the concept, in fact, integral to the concept itself, animals acquired the legal status of property. That could not be more significant. The fundamental premises of property law as many of you know, really actually haven't changed very much since the 17th century. Although, uh, one significant development is that some human beings who were once considered to be property fought and have since become legal persons, at least ostensibly. When my human rights hat is on, I will argue that there's not real equality on the ground, but at least we're working on it, and at least ostensibly, we are all now legal persons. Even inanimate constructs, like churches, Corporations, trusts, have become legal persons and can assert their legal interests in law. Animals remain the only sentient creature that is property in the eyes of the law. And since acquiring that status, they've been treated pretty much like the machines that Descartes said they were. Machines that don't think, don't feel, don't communicate, don't have their own interests, don't matter in any moral way. 
And as a result, the institutionalized use of animals has become ubiquitous in Western economies, yours and mine and all the others. So property law may not have changed very much since the 17th century, but some things have, like science. Right? In the many decades since Darwin first said, evolution, we have learned a lot. All branches of science have come together to reveal a truth. Uh, and when I say all branches of science, I mean biology, chemistry, genetics, zoology, etymology, it's a long list. These have transformed our understanding of other animals. These have eroded the lines that were traditionally drawn between us and them as though we were categorically different. It turns out that we are different in some ways, of course, but we're remarkably similar in many others, and in fact, in the fundamental ways. And it turns out that Darwin was right. We vary in degree, but not in kind. Other animals do think, they do feel, they do communicate, they do have their own interests. And as we've begun to realize this, they've begun to matter to us in moral ways. All of this leads us to a question that we continue to confront uh, and that we continue to struggle with. What are the morally relevant differences between humans and other animals that justify our harming them in ways that are unacceptable to harm one another? If you've ever cared about an animal and talked about a concern, you've of course heard in response about the differences between humans and other animals. But what are the morally relevant differences that justify the things that we do to them? So as we've wrestled with this question as a society or societies, it stimulated a new sense of respect for animals, and that's why many of you are here tonight. It's creating pressure to re-examine the outdated assumptions on which our laws are based, and to re-examine those very laws themselves, because the animal protection laws that we have in place, yours and mine, have the same source. They have their genesis in the 19th century. So, they bring the animal's interests into consideration, which is not an insignificant step forward from merely allocating ownership, as Locke had first envisioned, but it remains profoundly, and I mean profoundly, <coughs> insufficient in their terminology, in their assumptions, in their effects. Current animal protection laws really cling to the notion that animals are property, be, property to be exploited by people for our own purposes, even if they purport to regulate the suffering to which animals can be put in the course of that use. So modern laws seem superficially to protect animal interests, but you'll see that that protection very quickly begins to collide against a very hard wall of property status. So we gather here today having this discussion in the tension between old ideas and new knowledge. It's not the first time this has happened in law or in society. So there's cause to hope that we're progressing. Let me now turn to a Canadian example then of what I mean. I'll give you a bit of an overview of the seal hunt in Canada. So every spring, we call this spring, it's spring now where I come from, you call this winter, that's ridiculous, but anyway, that's another story. <laughs> every spring, the Northwest Atlantic harp seal uh, stops in Canada during its migration. And I ask you to bear in mind, as you listen to what I'm saying and as you listen to anybody talk to you about the seal hunt, uh, to bear in mind that the entire time seals spend in Canada is roughly six to eight weeks, sometimes a little longer. They're coming simply to give birth, to nurse their babies, to mate, and move on back to Greenland to their summer feeding. So they come late February, early March, and I don't want to digress too much. I, I stick to my notes because I'm an avid digressor, but I, I do want to say if you can imagine the scene, if one of those Google Maps or whatever those little technology things are now, Picture the scene of hundreds of thousands of female seals, gray to white, on the white ice, nursing their hundreds of thousands of babies. It's the largest nursery in nature. It's a spectacular sight, I've seen photos. Quite different from the one which comes a few weeks later when everything has turned to red. So once the pups are weaned, uh, there's mating, and then they, they, as I say, they return to Greenland. So hooded seals um, spend roughly the same time in Canada. They're much less abundant than the gray seals, uh, than the harp seals, but they're also subject to the commercial slaughter. So seals and other animals have been killed on Canadian shores and ice flows for many centuries. 
Uh, but the large-scale commercial hunt that, that we're talking about really began in earnest in the 19th century. And it happens mostly off the province of Newfoundland on, on Canada's east coast. So uh, large vessels would take hunters out to these whelping patches where mothers and babies were. Uh, then steel-hulled steamers and longliners came along in the 20th century. They've used airplanes to go out to the patches. There's also a smaller hunt that has taken place in, a, in the province of Quebec, and that hunt continues, but in recent years, there's very few seals to be found there. The modern controversy about the seal hunt uh, and the fact that it was just babies a few days being old really came to a head in 1983. Uh, at that time, after extensive lobbying on the part of NGOs, uh, the European Economic Community instituted a two-year ban on the import of products from harp and hooded seals, and that was later extended another four years. So, with Europe no longer interested in fur coats made of baby seals, the commercial hunt seemed to have ended. And it was a big day. But it was just shortly more than a decade later, in 1996, that the Atlantic cod fishery collapsed and the seal hunt was revived. And it came back in a big way. So by 2003, the Canadian government had established a TAC, T-A-C, Total Allowable Catch, of 350,000 animals, claiming that the harp seal population had exploded and it had to be reduced. Now that number seemed completely inconceivable to me until I began to read about uh, the number of kangaroos that meet their deaths here every year. And of course there's a big difference between the number of animals reported killed and the number that is actually killed in both of our countries. But beginning in 2009, the number of seals killed began to decline again to 38,000 in 2011. And the second decline also has European origins. NGOs continued their lobbying, and in 2009, the EU Parliament voted strongly in favor of a prohibition of the seal product trade. So what happened was pelt prices went way down, morale went way down, and there was a strong disincentive for anybody to go out and hunt because there was no market to sell their product. Canada, the government of Canada, did not care for this, and in 2011, with Norway, it launched a formal dispute at the WTO. Now the EU, I have to say, has held its ground and has even threatened a trade agreement that Canada uh, has been negotiating with Europe. But Canada too has held its ground and they've recently selected the panel members. So I don't see Canada backing down and it's, um, it's unknown where it's all gonna go. It may still go ahead. Also in 2009, the same year of the EU ban, Russia ended its own hunt for harp seals in the White Sea. Putin, <laughs> who knows blood when he sees it, called it a bloody industry, if you can believe it, <laughs> that, uh, that should have ended years ago. And then last year, uh, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and the Russian Federation banned the import and export of harp seal skins. And this was huge because according to government statistics, they take about 95% of them. So um, it would be reckless for me to say the seal hunt is over. The people in the know that I talk to say it won't be over in my lifetime. But from the SEAL's perspective, it is certainly a very promising chapter. Um, as Ruth mentioned, there's a, a bill introduced by one of our senators to actually ban the hunt. It's nice to hope I don't see it going through, but what's important about that bill is just that it keeps happening, just that the debate is continually out there and that the opposition of the Canadian public to the hunt is constantly, uh, is constantly a presence. So I'm gonna switch over to the legal framework. Um, say a little bit about that. In 19th century seal hunting, uh, the legal dispute was, and there was, uh, quite a bit. In fact, there's a lot of 19th century jurisprudence on the seal hunt, but it was all about conflicting claims between competing sealing vessels. It was a very competitive practice at the time, and the way they did it was um, one vessel would go out and they would find seals on a pan of ice, a big piece, and they would hurry out and hit them in the head kill them was the idea, but of course they didn't always kill them, uh, but they would immobilize them, and, but they wouldn't stop to skin them and, and dress them and get them all ready because they had to hurry to try and get other seals, so they would leave them on that pan of ice and then take off to carry on their work. Well, pans of ice float, so other sealers would come upon these pans and claim them for themselves, and then we'd have a fight over who did the seals really belong to. So that in itself is a, an edifying uh, series of jurisprudence if you're ever looking for something like that to read. 
I don't know why you would, but bless you, I've got a paper on it and everything. Um, so there was never any legal concern in any of this 19th century jurisprudence about uh, whether or how it is justifiable to allocate ownership in individual animals, a question that is emerging in modern animal rights law, just about how to allocate ownership among these competing people. But in modern times, uh, the interests of animals themselves have begun to receive attention, and many new legal issues have arisen. But the old premises still remain, this, this, this uh, collision that I was talking about between the interests of animals and their property status. So federal fisheries in Canada are regulated uh, pursuant to our Fisheries Act, and that includes marine mammals um, under the definition of fish. Now, it's not unusual in the context of industrialized animal exploitation or just animal exploitation at all to find that we give animals the name that describes the use they have for us. You have layers and broilers in the agriculture industry. You have waterfowl, game, vermin, pets, really, even. But it's unusual, I would suggest, uh, in the context of uh, uh, an area of law that is supposed to be so heavily based on science uh, that we would have seals still referred to as fish. And in a room at a, in a law school, I, I don't think I need to, to defend that this is not mere semantics, that words have meaning and significance. So the marine mammal regulations uh, that are passed under the Fisheries Act contain several offenses that are pretty much comparable to other hunting legislation. They prohibit disturbing a marine mammal except when fishing for one. So this is interesting. <laughs> I'm not making it up. So, so, but what is interesting is that you can't go out uh, and if you're concerned about an animal being hunted, you can't go out and make some noise and try and prevent and try and protect them and scare them away because that would be an offense. You can only disturb them for purposes of killing them. So the, they, the regulations prohibit attempting to kill a marine mammal except in a manner that is designed to kill him quickly. They require a person who kills or wounds a marine mammal to make efforts to retrieve him without delay. What do these words mean? As Keeley suggested, there's quite a lot of room for interpretation. There are a few provisions that specifically address seals, and most significantly, after the outcry in Europe about buying baby, um, baby seals for, for coats, the government, bartered, uh, the government banned the bartering or sale of white coats and bluebacks. So white coats are defined as harp seals that haven't begun to molt their white coats, and bluebacks are the hooded seals that have not molted their blue coats. Now, it's prohibited to barter and sell them. It's not prohibited to kill them. And sealers are permitted to kill, I think it's up to six animals for their own use. And more importantly, the white coat molt begins when an animal is about 10 to 12 days old. So even though my government will tell you that those emotional activists are exaggerating when they say that it's still a baby hunt and that all the seals being killed are babies, they're not exaggerating one bit because 95% of the animals that have been killed in the last few years were animals born that season. So they're between 12 days, three weeks, and two months on the outside. In fact, the, the organizations that I know say three months, just to be careful and to not be exaggerating, even though the seals aren't even really in these waters for, three, for quite that length of time. So one interesting point about the ban on um, the commercial hunt for these white coats and bluebacks was that it continued even after it was prohibited. And there is a story of an independent observer who worked really hard and only under incredible pressure caused the uh, regulators to come and do an inspection of a particular processor where they found piles of white coat and blueback pelts that had been brought in that very year. And again, after significant pressure, finally a hundred charges were laid. So the sealers resisted uh, with every, you gotta give them credit for creativity or their lawyers, I mean every legal argument you could come up with. They fought for 13 years, uh, there's half a dozen cases uh, with various defenses and arguments before 10 people were finally convicted in 2009. But what's of interest to me is that um, one of the things they tried to raise as a defense is the fact that DFO, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, had always made it clear to them that the regulations governing operation of the hunt wouldn't be enforced. Don't worry about it. Now when the NGOs, when the activists had said that, 
of course, they were dismissed, you know, as exaggerating emotional terrorists or whatever it is in the day. But now we have the sealers saying it themselves. The court didn't allow it as a defense, but it was interesting that the sealers said it. So I'm going to turn to the manner of killing seals. Is it cruel? That, of course, is the tagline associated with the seal hunt. It's cruel. Now, I avoid that word um, for reasons I'll come to in a moment, but I invite you to consider what you think about it. So seals may be lawfully killed by club, by firearm, a rifle or a shotgun, or by hack -a -pick. So hack -a -pick is a Norwegian tool. Um, there, I believe we're looking at a gaff and not a hack -a -pick, but they, they're very similar. So, uh, in fact, it's hard to tell which is which, but um, it's just like that. It's a long handle uh, with an iron head. I can't see the head. That's the only reason I have it. So it's got an iron head at one end and a curved spike at the other. Um, so, sorry, one is blunt and one is this curved spike. So until very recently, the ice flows uh, on Canadian eastern shores were very extensive. And so what sealers would do, as I described, is they would actually go on these flows, on these pans of ice, and they would strike seals directly with, uh, with hack picks or with clubs. And the name of the game is speed, because the seals are moving, the, the ice is moving, you've got to get as many as you possibly can. So they would hit them as, as much as they could and then move on, just immobilize them so they wouldn't get away. Now the idea is that they were supposed to kill them right away, but of course they didn't. And I've seen myself, hours and hours of, se hours of seal hunt footage, and there's much evidence showing repeatedly seals being skinned alive, just in the hurry. So eventually the regulation was amended to respond to all this footage that was coming out. So the government passed this requirement to do a blinking reflex test where the sealer was supposed to touch the eyes of the seal and see if, see if he's blinking before they proceed to skin the animal. The test was not scientifically precise, and there's really no reason to believe it was undertaken with any regularity, but it's already history because the hunt has changed. What's going on in recent years is climate change has changed the whole game. The ice pans aren't big enough anymore for the sealers to hunt on them, so what do they do? So we've gone back to a vessel hunt. So now the hunters are in boats that are 40 or 50 feet away, and they're taking shots with a gun at the seals. Now, I cannot overstate how dangerous winter, my friends, <laughs> winter in Canada. Um, the conditions can be extremely dangerous for the hunters. There's high or gale force winds, there's ocean swells, there's low visibility from fog, from freezing rain, very cold temperature. The vessel is moving, the seal is moving. So as a result, many of these animals fall into the water after they're shot and they drown or they die from their injuries. Or, um, if the shot is successful and the seal stays on the pan, they're retrieved by way of a gaff. So it's a long implement with a sharp hook at the end, which you Im impale the animal by, pull her off the ice, through the water, up into the boat, where you've got her. So instead of the blinking reflex test, the regulations now say that a person must palpate the animal's cranium after she is shot to confirm that it has been crushed, if not, strike the seal's head with a club or hack a pick until it is crushed. It is prohibited to skin a seal until the cranium has been crushed and at least one minute has elapsed after her two auxiliary arteries located beneath the flippers have been severed. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Even if this test is a realistic way of ensuring that a seal is unconscious, and even if it is reasonable to think that sealers can and will do it in the conditions I just described to you, the animal has already been pulled in the manner I described to you, off the ice, through the water, onto the boat, through a sharp implement, impaling her face, her ear, her nose, or some other body part. So NGO observers have argued for decades that it is completely unreasonable to expect that any laws purporting to regulate the manner in which seals are killed are meaningfully enforced. The boats are widely dispersed over hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. There are hundreds of boats. It used to be thousands of boats taking part. Conditions are very fast moving, very dangerous. There's very few observers. When it comes to kangaroos, of course, there's nobody there observing. So the only person who really knows how the animal dies is the person who kills her himself. And in the context of seals, 
the sealers, local government officials, and police are all from small, very tightly knit communities, a fact that really can't be ignored in the context of the exercise of discretionary powers. So I want to say a word about terminology to this legal audience. Government of Canada has called this the most humane hunt in the world. I know, honestly. Now it can only do so because in this context, I'm critical of my government, but quite frankly, they're not really much worse than any other because we all have that language in our legislation. And the only reason that they can use this terminology is because the word humane has no actual meaning. What does humane mean? Think about it. It's unclear how any massive slaughter of sentient beings can be called humane. But in the context of institutionalized animal exploitation, that word really literally takes on a connotation of Or Orwellian doublespeak. Humane is a word that is so vague and so undefined, and it conjures up pretty images of everybody happily falling asleep, which of course have no connection whatsoever to reality. So I mentioned that I avoid the word cruelty. Now, everybody uses that word cruelty for, for obvious reasons, and I mean no criticism whatsoever of, of the use of the word, but the reason I try to avoid it is because it seems to me that cruelty connotes a malevolent sort of state of mind that is too high a standard, that is really beside the point. It means that the people doing it are bad, and the reasons they're doing it are bad, and, and that's not true at all. These are actually very lovely people. <laughs> the people of Newfoundland were in the news after 9-11 for all opening up their homes to all these Americans who got stranded. And, and anyway, I'm, see, I'm not looking down and I'm digressing. But I mean, it, it's too, it's it, that's not the point. It's not evil people causing, causing pain gratuitously. That's the problem with the word cruelty, that it implies a sense of gratu gratuity and that as soon as there's any human purpose, right, we're trying to make money, even sport hunting, killing for fun, killing something because you enjoy it, killing, killing a, I shouldn't say something, I'm sorry, killing a, a living creature because you enjoy it is not cruel in a legal sense because there's a human purpose. The suffering isn't gratuitous. So it excuses harm that's done for any human purpose. So I try to avoid a word like cruel and focus on accurate terminology like violence that focuses on the effects of the act rather than its purpose. But the words cruel and humane sometimes appear directly in animal protection laws, and they operate similarly to other very pithy terminology that you find there. Canadian criminal law, like, uh, similar to the laws here and in other places, generally prohibits causing animals unnecessary pain, suffering, and injury. So theoretically, these laws apply to the seal hunt, but there's never been a single criminal charge prosecuted. Uh, nor hardly at all in the industrial context where most animals are regularly and predictably hurt on a daily basis. So the idea of prohibiting unnecessary pain, suffering, and injury sounds good until you think about it, right? If we prohibit unnecessary pain, suffering, and injury, we have created a corollary and we have permitted ourselves to cause necessary pain, suffering, and injury. Well, what's necessary? We write the laws, we interpret them, we have effectively written ourselves permission to cause animals pain, suffering, and injury when, it, when we see fit. So, uh, sorry, the mere use of the word necessary in this context, I, I invite you to see it as a big red light in your legislation as in mine. The use of the word necessary really demonstrates the stark categorical distinction that the law still makes between human persons and animal things. For example, if a starving person were to kill another person to eat them <laughs> and claim it was necessary, if a really nice person desperately waiting for a kidney were to kidnap a stranger in the night and go to a private surgery and help herself to one of his kidneys and claim it was necessary for her own survival, we don't really have to go before a court to find out whether that's going to provide any kind of successful legal defense, right? As between legal e equals, you don't use the word necessary in that context. It's silly and, in fact, even obscene. So the subtleties of language, as you well know, disguise harmful behavior. The law prohibits causing unnecessary pain, suffering, and injury. Government tells us it's all humane. So in the absence of any information to the contrary, the otherwise occupied public is satisfied. 
That's where facts come in. That is why there's another legal angle to the seal hunt, and that's the one that I was involved in for several years. So since the hunt occurs on public land, and it's supported by public money, and it consumes what are, after all, regarded as public resources, the public would seem to have a clear entitlement to accurate information about it. But observation of the hunt uh, has been a persistent challenge. The regulations prohibit anyone from coming within a half nautical mile of a person fishing for seals without a seal fishery observation license. And the constitutionality of that scheme has been challenged twice. Once before my time, 1988, IFA succeeded in establishing that the licenses uh, constrained observers and contravened their freedom of expression. This was a very interesting case. Hey, is that Tommy? No. <laughs> Uh, so the observers established that uh, it violated our right to, their right to freedom of expression, which is protected under our Canadian uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The permit, the permit procedure was seen to be official discretion at large, with no specified standards. And what's really interesting about that case um, is that it confirmed that uh, the right to freedom ex of expression included the right to gather the information which formed the basis of the expression. So it's a, a real media kind of protection, right? So after that case, the government then added conditions and standards to the, to the seal fishery observation license. But in 1998, the International Fund for Animal Welfare commenced a second proceeding, alleging that the government was frustrating efforts of those who were trying to observe and document the hunt, and that it was doing so in order to protect its false claims that the hunt was humane. So you see on the screen, uh, or Oh, sorry. Right, so you see on the screen on the bullet, thank you. Um, it, so the license is issued for one day. Doesn't seem obviously problematic, but this hunt is occurring over a huge area. So one day means you get the license, you get in a helicopter, you fly out and you finally find it just as it becomes dusk and you have to turn around and come back. Uh, the permit is renewable up to a maximum of two times. Well, there was a lot of discretion in that language, and so often the government would say, we think you've seen enough. There's too many observers out there, and just deny them. License holder couldn't approach within 25 meters of a person who was, who was hunting. What does that mean? That means that all the hunter has to do is get within 25 meters of you, and you're in violation of your permit. And in fact, there's many stories of um, brave observers uh, running for their lives, being chased with these uh, dangerous implements that I've described, and thereby in violation of their license. <laughs> anyway, so, um, and the five nautical mile that you, you uh, also being permitted within five nautical miles of the area was also problematic because the, the, everything's moving so quickly, right? The hunt, the pans of ice move around, as I explained, so being confined to a small area meant that uh, it was easier for sealers to get out of your view. So there's lots more to that, but I, I needn't uh, trouble you with those details. So, so, we, so, I got involved at this point and we went to court challenging the, the, the conditions on that basis. It was quite fun, you know, it's not often in, in a practice that you get to allege so directly, we think you're trying to hide this from us. <laughs> we think you're keeping us from this because you don't want your people to know the truth. So the, uh, the only reported decision um, is an interim injunction uh, because as they were adding these conditions, IFA uh, went right to court right away to try and prevent them from being added at all. And the court wouldn't grant the injunction because they thought there were too many important issues at stake and it wasn't the sort of thing that should be dealt with on an interim basis. So the case carried on in litigation for a number of years and it ultimately settled. And I struggled a long time. Uh, it was many years uh, in this work. And I struggled looking back wondering what had been gained in the end because the hunt carried on and the conditions were a little bit better, but um, still they were significant. Um, and now with the passage of time, I look back and I see that uh, it, it was a really important part of the whole picture uh, in terms of the hunt because what's been so important is, the, is, is, is holding the government to account is showing up at those discoveries, I don't know what you call them here, but the depositions, discoveries, when you, you get to examine, thank you, the witnesses. So I, I was examining these big government witnesses. I've never been so nervous in my life, but they answered my questions. You know, I had to, I stayed up all night trying to 
word these questions, and, and then they answered, you know, and, and we, we asked them to provide documents, and they had to provide the documents. You know, so the government had to be accountable. It had to provide these things. The media was interested in the litigation because media is always interested in litigation. And so the story was continued. And we were watching, right? While the government is in litigation for these many years, it knows it's being watched and has to be careful about how things go on. So it had a lot of effects that you see in retrospect as being a, a part of the big, uh, as the, of the big movement. Um, observers continue to go. I, I'd like to give them props, if that's a slang term expression you recognize here, for, uh, for going out every spring to still try and document this horrible thing. Uh, and it's not just photo shoots with Paul McCartney, it's the real hard, ugly work of having to watch this stuff every single day and chase down for the best shots. Uh, they gather photographic and video evidence, they show seals being dragged, cut open, skinned while they're obviously conscious. There's never been charges laid against the sealers, as I say. However, those photos have really, you've seen them, right? I know you've seen them because they're out there. Uh, well, you've seen them tonight, but you've seen them before. And the EU saw them and Russia saw them. And now those markets are closed. So just for the last, um, just very briefly, uh, for last couple of minutes, I want to say a little bit about why has this hunt perpetuated. Because I think like kangaroos, the seals are, are part of a very complex problem. There's many factors that have played a role in perpetuating the hunt, and there's many factors that play a role in its current decline. So over the years, the hunt has really been promoted or defended as either sustainable or necessary to control seal populations or to protect cod stocks. It's economically important, it's culturally important, all of these different things at different times. So a brief word about seals and fisheries. As the story goes, the sea used to be so full of cod that you could go out there with your bucket and scoop them up. But for many decades, Atlantic cod were subject to extreme overfishing. Everybody knew it. There were scientific documents warning the government. It was, it was Canada and many other countries that were, that were using these huge uh, nets. And warnings came for decades, and nobody did anything about it because the money was so good. And then sure enough, in the 90s, the cod fishery completely collapsed. So rather than take responsibility, the first thing the government said was, it's the seals. The seals are eating all the cod. And that was quickly proved silly, so they changed it. Well, they're not eating all the, they didn't cause the, they didn't cause the collapse, but they are impeding the recovery. And they continue to say that to this day, even though um, that allegation is unsupported by scientific evidence and it's contraindicated. Governments like to estimate the amount of fish consumed by seals. That's a big number, right? It plays well in the media. But it really doesn't tell us very much about the scheme of things in, in complex ocean ecosystems. Seals spend a very brief time in Canadian waters. Cod is a part of their diet. They also eat the predators of cod. So it's very complex, as ocean ecosystems are. And there's evidence from predator control programs that there are unintended consequences, right? Nature's complicated. Try and take Mother Nature on at your peril. You can't beat her at her own game. So you think you're the master of nature and you think you can control it and we're gonna take out this predator and oops, there's all these other things that we didn't think about that happen and can ultimately uh, weaken the structure and functioning of an entire ecosystem. But still there are some government representatives who are advocating mass culls of seals to benefit the cod. The cod fishery, by the way, has come back, and it's now 10 times bigger than the seal fishery. Uh, a word about uh, climate change and population reduction. The effects of climate change have been dramatic. If we are going to cheer the decline of the seal hunt, um, on the flip side, unfortunately, is the effects of climate change. Because I mentioned to you that the ice pans now are so small, the sealers can't hunt on them. Well, not only can the sealers not hunt on them, the mothers can't give birth on them. There's not enough ice. So for the last two years, something like 80% uh, of the babies are thought not to have survived because either the mothers can't get on the ice so the babies are born in the water and drown, or there's not enough ice for them to stay on to nurse, or when the ice is breaking and rubbing against each other, the babies fall in and get crushed, or there's not ice for them to rest on when they're learning to, as they're just starting to gain fat and, and swim. So. It's, it's a really rough scene for them. And what this means is that the population that everybody thought was so abundant, it's exploded in the blink of an eye, is in danger. 
So there's high ice-related mortality, there's commercial hunts. These same seals are hunted not only in Canada, but then when they swim up to Greenland, they also die as bycatch in other fisheries. So scientists are predicting that entire year classes of harp seals are going to be missing from future population surveys, but that that's not going to be apparent for a few years until these pups would have reached breeding age and we start to see that they're, they're missing, basically, from the population surveys. Still, the hunt continues, and our government set a tack in the last few years of 400,000. Uh, a couple last points in closing. So the market for seal products, um, other than the famous white furs of newborn babies, there's really not been much of a market. At one point, the carcasses were sold as cheap food for fox and mink in the intensive fur operations in eastern provinces. I see this as an interesting parallel with kangaroos because the main market is for pet food. So you're killing wild animals uh, in order to just give them as food to, to captive animals. And it's, there's something, there's something uh, ugly in there. Uh, but anyways, that didn't last because, for us because the mink were getting sick because of the seal meat. So the federal government has tried to develop markets for seal pepperoni, seal jerky, seal oil, leather, and other products, but no real luck. For a period in the 90s, there was a, a real booming market in seal penises. As you, uh, shall I have you guess what they were for? It was an aphrodisiac trade. Uh, countless animals were killed and discarded when they turned out to be female. And we started litigation at the same time as that observer litigation that I told you about, uh, alleging that the government was facilitating and failing to prevent the unregulated sale of a controlled substance, testosterone. So that market slowly waned um, and the case settled. So the governments of Canada and Newfoundland continue to actively promote the hunt and they try to open markets abroad. For more than a decade, they've tried to sell meat to China. China won't take it. They're concerned about food security because seals are processed as fish and not as meat with comparable oversight. Not that that oversight is so great, but that's another talk. Uh, now the federal government is trying to promote the use of heart valves of seals to replace the pig valves that are being used, and they're trying to get that research done in China. For many years, including most recently, much of the seal's flesh is discarded. Nobody wants it, there's nothing to do with it, and the only real market continues to be in their skin, but even that market has collapsed. There's media reports of some 400,000 skins being stockpiled, and new reports that the government is negotiating with processors to stockpile even more. The federal government is not letting this go. Um, a word on economics, nobody makes any money doing this. Uh, it amounts to a few hundred dollars a year per sealer. All of the money goes into the hands of a few families that really control the processing aspect of it. Um, and on the other hand, the hunt is extremely expensive. Think about everything that the government has to do to promote uh, the kangaroo slaughter. You see the same thing with seals. The government, in our case, has to uh, go out and break the ice to let the sealing boats through. It has to rescue some sealers when they get into trouble. They're traveling all over Europe, doing all of these promotions, trying to get markets. They're doing this WTO challenge, etc. Slaughtering as many seals as possible in a, a short time is very messy work. Killing kangaroos at night in the outback is messy work. Uh, icy conditions damage the boats of sealers. Hunters don't enjoy it. I, I, I don't think there's anyone who enjoys it, but nor do they like being told by outsiders that they won't, right? That what they do is bad. It's a long-standing cultural practice. The community's songs and stories celebrate the heroism of the men who went out to the dangerous ice for so many generations. So, it's important to be sensitive to cultural practice and not to challenge people's cultural practices for our ulterior motives. I quite agree, like racism or other prejudices, which are sometimes at play. But in the absence of ulterior motives, it's quite unclear to me why the fact that a community has long engaged in a harmful behavior is justification for perpetuating it. In a related argument, we also hear hunters saying, well, why do you bother us? It's not very pretty in a slaughterhouse either. And in fact, they've even written documents about how terrible things are in the slaughterhouse and why are you picking on us? It's just that our abattoir is out in the open so you can see it. And that they're right, of course, but it seems to me it's a very twisted moral theory that would perpetuate one harmful practice because there's another one. 
right? This has been a successful strategy, though, in the animal realm, but only because we don't think through the absurdity of the logic. Since we can't do everything, we can't do anything. If we can't solve all the problems, not, let's not solve any. In the realm of human problems, it's better understood, not perfectly, but better understood that just because a person can only talk about one thing at a time, that doesn't mean there aren't other problems as well. Uh, the Canadian government claims that the commercial seal hunt is important to the Inuit who live in remote communities. That's entirely false. That's the Aboriginal hunt for subsistence has nothing to do with the commercial hunt. It's not opposed by any of the large NGOs. It happens later in the summer. It's older seals. They kill about 1,000 every year, and there's no organization that I know who has ever opposed it. The federal government intentionally scuttles this to try and bring into the front the Aboriginal people that it is, by the way, entirely neglecting in all other circumstances. So public opinion polls repeatedly show strong opposition on the part of Canadians to this hunt but no federal government has been willing to respond to them. This one bold senator, Mark Harb, who keeps trying to get his bill out and who's got his bill out there now really has to be congratulated. And the reason, I think, is very simple politics. There are six or seven federal seats in that region. And even if all the Canadians would be grateful that uh, the hunt was ended, nobody's vote would swing on it. Whereas in those regions, if they canceled the hunt, you can bet votes were gonna swing on it. So that's the political reality. The public is still opposed, but there's a creeping deference, I think, to this cultural practices. Uh, there's powerful new ad campaigns by the fur industry that fur is green. Don't get me started. There's persistent government claims, not only that the hunt is humane, but that those who oppose it, whether for ethical or environmental reasons, are dangerous extremists. Our federal government was just found paying $75,000 to a social media firm for a pilot project to monitor, hello, democracy? Uh, to monitor online chat rooms and political commentary with a view to correcting misinformation pertaining to the hunt. I hope you're scared because your country is remarkably similar to mine. <laughs> um, on the other hand, there is significant economic development in Newfoundland. They've discovered oil offshore. Uh, it's been in production for about a decade. Climate change that harms the seals means that the ice is open earlier for crab fishing, which is far more lucrative for sealers if unfortunate for crab. So as the provincial economy improves, adherence to this dangerous, dirty work may start to wane, especially if the markets remain precarious. And there's talk of an industry buyout where the government would buy back the licenses as it has in other fisheries. So I'd like to conclude um, by saying that I see all of these themes at play here in Australia. In many ways, the approach to kangaroos is similar to the approach to seals in, in Canada, and not only seals, snow geese, cormorants, wolves, uh, black bear, moose, coyotes, each issue has its own subtleties, but the same range of arguments is made again and again about why we not only can, but must, we must kill them. They rest on the same assumptions that all other species exist for human purposes, that any human interest necessarily trumps any animal interest that we can and should regulate others' populations, we, the only species that is set about destroying the biological basis of our own existence, assumptions that are increasingly, I need the glasses and I refuse to get them, increasingly, uh, increasingly contradicted um, by scientific, environmental and ethical reasons. So a more modern approach uh, recognizes that species become abundant because of a sweet, if they're abundant, by the way, let's look over historical knowledge, become abundant because of a suite of factors, including their own compatibility with anthropogenic environmental changes as a function of their overall adaptability. Meaning, if we really care about populations and if we're really concerned about abundance, then we need to look at our own behavior and what role that it's playing in allowing that to happen. So as we expose the old assumptions and the current approaches to wildlife, we chip away at the species barrier, the line we still draw between us and them. And we seek to have seals and kangaroos regarded not just as populations to be managed, but as individuals to be respected, to live their lives. We acknowledge that there are legitimate concerns in human-non-human -human relations, but we seek less violent ways of addressing them. Everybody, including lawyers, has a role to play at every turn, whether challenging particular aspects of a practice, governing legal regimes, 
in understanding the limitations of those regimes, in challenging industry government claims about how necessary and humane it all is, in assisting advocates in asserting their rights to observe and publicize information, or in participating in the kind of discussion that we're having here tonight. So I thank you very much for your attention.